Hello, art historians. I'm back with our next video. Um, it's going to be um, a two-parter. Um, we're going to have two videos on impressionism and surreal. I'm sorry, expressionism and surrealism. Um, so, because uh, there are several um, of these works, so uh, like I said, it's going to be a two-parter. So, what is expressionism slash surrealism? There, those terms are often um, interchangeable. Um, so how is that any different than impression, impressionism? So an impressionism is giving an impression of something. We're looking at like a, it's like um, almost like a, a rough draft of something. Expressionism, think about your expression. Um, your expressionism is about, um, it, it is uh, art that is often uh, distorted or exaggerated to show emotion and to pull in a strong emotional response from the viewer. Um, it is much more planned as opposed to impressionism and post-impressionism that have a, have a tendency to be a little more um, spontaneous. Um, it is made often of disjointed spaces, disjointed images, things that um, feel more fantastical. Um, there are often, um, it is often a dark side of humanity, often violent. Um, and it is, um, a good portion of it is in reaction to um, sort of the chaos um, of the world. We're dealing with a lot of symbolism in expressionist uh, art. A lot of things um, stand for something else. Um, the, the colors are often um, discordant. They, they make us feel um, anxious or um, um, they, they, there is just sort of this, this strong sense of a need to respond to or react to the art that we are seeing. Um, and often those images are um, disturbing. They are, um, they are beyond the realistic. They move towards the fantastical. Um, often um, people uh, talk about dream states or nightmares, that sort of thing. So let's get into it. And you, the, the sooner we get into it, the sooner you'll understand what I'm talking about, like it being strong emotional response, both in the piece and to attempt to draw a strong response from the viewer. So let's get into our first one. So our first one is um, Edvard Munch. That's how you say that. Please don't call him Munch. It makes me kooky. Um, so Edvard Munch, um, this is the piece from 1893. He actually painted this same scene four times um, in 1893 and 1895, both of those in pastels. Um, 1895, he then did another one, which was a lithograph. And then in 1910, he painted just tempera with no pastel. So he returned to this image over and over and over again. Um, this is tempera and pastel on cardboard. Um, uh, so when we look at this piece, we're, we're first looking at, I mean, let's look at the colors. The colors are discordant and shocking. Um, the play between um, that blue and orange is, is really strong. Um, the um, the this symbolism of what appears to be an unseen force impacting us, right? We can't tell what is causing the scream, but we can see that there is one. Um, the head is um, elongated. Um, the hands are elongated. The head is very skull shaped. The mouth is ovoid, like in an oval. Um, and it is minimalist. It's, it's short on details, but big on impact. Um, you can, when you sit with it for any length of time, um, you see lots of geometric forms, the ovals, the circles, the lines, the squares. Um, but then you get into, um, you get into some of the other pieces. Um, oh, and by the way, he saw the same um, uh, Peruvian mummy exhibit in Paris that Gauguin did. Um, and so that is echoed here as well. But you're clearly, where are you? You're clearly on a wharf, um, like on a pier. Uh, you're by water. 
You're, this is a bridge. Um, we see some land here and water in the background. Here's some little boats. Um, this is the sky, right? So when you first look at it, you're not quite sure what you're seeing, but that's what you're seeing. There's a person who's ooh, kind of curvy here, um, reacting to some stimuli. We're not exactly sure what it is, um, but clearly suffering, right? And and clearly this is synesthesia. This is that um, visual representation of a feeling or a sound. Um, and so um, here, we're, here is this bridge. Here this person is facing towards us. These are people walking away from us. Um, and that's what that perspective is. Um, the foreground and the background seem to blend together. We're not quite sure. We're pretty sure this is land and that's water and that's sky. But everything seems to be very confused and confusing. Um, it is a, what we call a swirling composition. Your eye continues to move um, around because you, you want to look here, but then you come down here against this line, and then the line brings you back here to the swirl, which brings you to the sky, but then the sky brings you... It, your eye continues to move, 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 move. Um, the, this person is clearly crying out in some horrific scream in response to, we don't know, um, right? But it's clearly um, a response to something horrific. There's that strong emotion. Um, the brush strokes are long, the brush strokes are thick. Um, the lines bring our eyes. Um, now, the landscape appears to be equally as fretful as the the person the, the the landscape seems disturbed the sky is scary um you know we all of this makes us feel uncomfortable um and that is you know that strong emotion a discordant colors the anguish the 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 emotional response that's expressionism um and so when we look at that, we have to remind ourselves that this is an excellent example of expressionism. Um, but when we're looking at it, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, it, it's beautiful and um, your themes there are very clear. It, it's very clearly suffering, but, you know, strong emotion, chaos. But also, like, this is a, an individual who appears to be abandoned by those around him, right? This is, this is expressionism on that dark end, that negative side that we talked about. But it doesn't always have to be because this is also expressionism, okay? When we're talking about expressionism, expressionism is uh, the attempt to pull a strong emotion from the viewer and express a strong emotion. This is clearly expressing a strong emotion. Um, this is The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. Um, this is located at the Belvedere Museum um, in Vienna, Austria. Uh, Klimt was... Um, famous for um, uh, this, what we call his gold period. Uh, he made a trip to um, Ravenna, Italy, where there is, we, we saw that, um, San Vitale. Um, and he saw the, um, give me one second to take a drink. He saw the mosaics of Justinian and Theodora at the, the church at San Vitale. Um, he saw all the gold um, that was in much of the Byzantine art at the time. And he came back to Austria and uh, slid into what we call his gold period. Um, and so he paints with oil paints and gold leaf on canvas. Um, but it is very much um, that it's still that expressionist um, and surrealist piece. Where's the surrealism in it? it? It feels not quite real. It feels fantastical. The body shapes are not quite perfect. The, the background is not quite perfect. And the strong emotion is there. Um, it's just a more positive emotion than the emotion that we saw in, um, in the, um, the screen. So um, there's very little human form that we see here. And what human form we do see is not exactly... Um, 
lifelike. Uh, her hand that is around his neck doesn't quite feel real. His hand that comes up to her face feels a little strange. Um, it is part of what we call, I'm gonna scooch forward for a second, it's part of what we call a gold period because there's this gold leaf here on the background, but also here, and you can see all these wonderful swirls. Um, and look here, this is um, with all these squares here, and then the swirls are underneath, let me go back. So it's all these squares with swirls in between them. And what's amazing is that this appears to be a combination of two things. It's a combination of things that are rectilinear, it looks like rectangles and things that are curvilinear that are curved like circles and ovals and what's excellent is he is represented by those rectilinear shapes she is represented by the curvilinear shapes but then when you get a little closer you realize let me scroll in again that in his rectilinear side there are hints of her curves and on her curvilinear side there are hints of triangles that are, are more geometric. And so we get this really beautiful combination of their two pieces coming together and then they seem to be melting into that background. Her flowers are there on the ground, his rectangles are in the sort of vines, they're both sort of melting into the gold background. Um, the, it, it is uh, feels almost three-dimensional because the, the impasto is so thick. Um, but again, the bodies are suggested, but not actually here. We see hands, um, heads, shoulders, and her feet. Um, the rest of the body is simply implied. But there is a tenderness, a, um, a, um, a powerful passion that is here. The gold behind their heads feels almost... Um, ethereal, religious, uh, spiritual. Um, they are um, caught up in a very strong emotion, love. Um, it is sensual. It appeals to your senses. Um, it is a, ex it is exploring that sensuality between two people, but also in, in a very subtle way because their bodies are almost not even visible. Um, they have flower crowns. There is sort of a... Um, a a fairy fantasy idea of the two of them. This appears to be perfection, fulfillment, um, passion, um, tenderness, this, this idea that the, it, it feels like a very full emotion, but also feels very soft and tender. Um, it is it is that definition of expressionist. It is emotion. Um, it is strong emotion in both the composition and the emotion that it pulls from the viewer. Um, it is. Uh, it feels somewhat fantastical, right? Like fantasy. Um, it 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 is a uh, an odd exaggeration of the moment. It it, it is. Um, uh, a distortion of proportions, um, but at the same time, it um, it tells a very complete story. Now, I need you to pay very close attention to the fact that th this canvas is very odd in that it's square. It's 71 by 71. We don't often see square canvases, and oftentimes this piece is cropped to make it uh, either a really long portrait piece or it's cropped here to make it uh, like almost uh, in landscape so that you get uh, this and you lose the body. It's an odd um, people the, when when it's sold it um, it is often cropped to lose a portion of the um, the piece. Now this is the kiss by um, Gustav Klimt. Now I. It's important that you pay attention to this because this is the kiss by Gustav Klimt, 1907 to 1908. Um, the world is changing and in flux. We're coming up to what will become the, the you know, the World War One. Things are, uh, are tense. Like it's, you know, there's Art Nouveau going on, but there's also a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, there are some, not great things going on in parts of the world. And this is, it's really important that you see this. This is the kiss by Gustav Klimt, right? Same years, this is the kiss by Constantine Brancusi. Um, Brancusi is Romanian. He moved to Paris and lived um, a good portion of his life 
uh, in Paris, but he is uh, Rom Romanian by birth, and this is important in, in his art. Um, and so it's important that you think about the um, this piece in comparison with um, like uh, this expressionism and you separate the, the, the two pieces from each other. So let's make sure that we separate the two pieces and that we um, think about um, that we think about one is um, the the kiss. Um, in paint and this is the kiss in sculpture. Okay, so we're looking at this. Um, it's limestone by Brancusi. Um, it is not in the round, the back is not carved. Um, it's just carved on the three sides and the top. Um, it is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, Brancusi has his own room in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, a whole room just filled with his stuff. Um, and he is considered to be the, the person who redefined what modern sculpture would be like. Um, it becomes minimalist. Um, it takes it down to the most important things, which is again, expressionism, that idea of expression, expressing um, strong emotions. And here we have that again. We, it's that idea of, of coming down to um, the most basic primitive piece. Um, we're gonna talk about that too. Um, this is, um, uh, it is meant to feel ancient. Um, kind of like archaic Greek. It's similar. Um, some of the some of the decoration of it is similar. Uh, look at the hair. Look at the eyes. Um, it, so it's meant to feel um, uh, primitive, but also um, it's meant to feel a little more uh, modern as well. So old and new. Um, um, he, when we're when we're thinking about Brancusi. Um, we're thinking about the fact that his art is, um, think about Rodin. Rodin broke the rules of what sculpture was supposed to be like, and he made it more human. But Brancusi takes Rodin's rules and breaks them even more and takes them back to almost the primitive. And you see here, um, it's very rectilinear. We have this almost cube. Um, and uh, you can see that they share um, an eye. Um, and what you are supposed to be looking at is um, uh, Romanian peasants had a, a history of working in stone and wood. He takes that Romanian peasant artistry, brings it to France, is influenced by people like Rodin, um, uh, and he works um, the, the, the kind of strong emotional pull of expressionism into um, the the Romanian peasant work. And he shared a studio space with Rodin. So you see the influence of Rodin's emotion in, in, in Brancusi's work. Um, it's simple. It's block-like. It is approaching, again, a word that I've said a couple of times that we'll get to in a video or two. Um, it is approaching cubism. Remember, I talked to, um, you know, I talked to you before when we did um, Cezanne. Think about that idea of cubism. This is approaching that again. Um, it is not detailed. Um, it is not meant to be anatomically correct. He always says that this, this piece came from the block. It was like spoke to him from the block. Um, it is what we call avant-garde and anything that we call avant-garde is something that is new and different from the art that, of its time. And that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to, to accomplish something new and different. Uh, it is rejecting uh, the rules of art. That's another sort of one of those ideas of, of expressionism is to, this idea of rejecting what the rules of art are. And so, um, you know, this is what's interesting is um, you see that she is, um, here's, she is, here's her eye, her long hair, uh, her breast and her, her stomach. Here is his shorter hair, his eye, their lips are touching, um, his and then his full chest um, and his hair is short. Uh, his arms come around behind her head. Her arms come around behind his head. I'm gonna go to the next piece where you can sort of explore it uh, a little bit in pieces. Look at their eye. Remember, we think, we go back to that idea of the um, tlatilco and the bifurcation. They share that eye um, and the hair is textured. Um, it, it is a single, what we call a single incised line that separates them. One line that runs 
here that separates them into two pieces, except here where their lips touch and here where their arms touch. Um, it reveals sort of the structure of the limestone. Um, it is left raw. Uh, you can see all the little dots and lines and pox of, of the limestone. Um, he didn't polish it. Uh, he could have. Um, often when we see limestone statues, they've been polished so that they shine. This one doesn't. Um, and so how does this play into our, um, our um, expressionism. It, it is a, it is a strong ex emotional response. They are so close together um, that they are practically one thing, right? Um, and and it, they it is this idea that it is both um, new and old. Um, it feels a little bit like that Venus of Willendorf, right? So it feels so ancient, but also so modern. Um, they they are two, but they are one. Um, there is this, um, th this idea of, again, that strong primitive emotion of the response between the two bodies, and also the, the, I, the strong um, idea of, of um, of it being fantastical, like we, we, people don't look like that. Um, it's it's really, really cool. Um, we're gonna do one more today, uh, but this is Brancusi's The Kiss, and then we'll move on to um, this piece, which is our biggest example of synesthesia. I, I've been using that word a lot recently, but remember synesthesia. Um, uh, Vasily Kandinsky actually had synesthesia, which meant that like for him, colors, made sound um uh like when he painted this it would sound like something and when he would listen to music um he would see um music sounds made colors um and so uh, it is an actual psychological a physical thing that happens to people. It is a real thing. Um, it, like I said, it's called synesthesia. I had a student who had synesthesia. It was very cool to talk to her. Um, so what you're looking at here is a piece, improvisation, which is a musical term, right? And remember that we're talking about Vasily Kandinsky, who suffered from synesthesia. So there's that surrealism, that sort of fantastical, not quite real thing. And we're dealing with strong emotions because this picture is a picture and a sound and um, it multiple senses and super strong emotions. Um, this is at uh, the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, so you can go and see this um, uh, in New York. We are moving closer and closer and closer to fully abstract work. This is strongly abstracted. Um, it's, it tells a definite story, um, but it is very strongly abstracted. Um, and when I show you the pieces, you'll be like, oh, um, but um, he really wanted, here we come again with that, that emotion. He really wanted you to look at this painting and, and hear it. And he wanted you to hear it like it was what we call atonal music, like loud sounds, not didn't feel good, noise, right? Um, and so because of that, um, we have to remember that Kandinsky is Russian. Uh, this is a huge time of political upheaval and chaos in Russia, Bolsheviks, uh, uh, revolution, bad. It's Everything is bad. Um, and so, here we are seeing an, uh, an almost um, apocalyptic scene that's going on here. We have a church in the background. That's what this is. Okay. We have a wave. Um, a fl it's a flood. These are horses. Okay. But also meant to look a little bit like an eye. Um, so it's a little bit scary. Um, then we have um, um, a cannon. That's what this is. We've, we've got the cannon here. Um, this is a boat. Um, and a, a possibly a person, okay? So lots of really scary things happening here. Lots of these lines that feel jagged and discordant. He, again, the, it, the word is in music is atonal. Um, it's also cacophony, uh, C-A-C-O-P-H-O-N-Y. Cacophony is like noisy, doesn't go together, doesn't sound like a harmony. Um, we're looking at the atmosphere in the background, but it feels very confusing. Um, and there's this 
contrast of colors. Um, it, it is using color in a different way um, as, as separate um, little vignettes, little things happening. Um, it is very strong use of black line in a way that we haven't seen before, but it does have a rhythm to it. Um, it feels almost musical. Um, it has a musicality to it. It flows. Um, and he is trying to express um, the, the, the chaos of the time and pull you in to an emotional response to this work. Uh, and so when we're looking at it, we're looking at extreme color. We're looking at a very complex composition. Um, and we're looking at uh, really trying to uh, see the story he is, I'm sorry, see the story he is trying to tell us of the, the chaos, the emotional upheaval, the turmoil that is happening um, in Russia at the time. Um, and he does that through color and line, but also he wants you to hear it. Um, and that is why it is given a, um, a musical uh, title. That's why it's improvisation. Um, Kandinsky was a genius. Uh, and I, I love his work immensely. Uh, we are moving, like I said, closer and closer to fully abstract work, but this is still representational. It, it is abstracted, but it is not abstract, okay? Um, because it's clearly meant to be something. Um, so that is the end of today's part one video of Expressionism and Surrealism. I'll see you again next time uh, for five more Expressionist Surrealist works. Um, and so I will say have a good day and I'll see you again next time.